It's time to stop beating around the bush and trying to be politically correct in the fitness industry. When something is blatantly wrong and incorrect, i.e. goes against foundational elements of physiology and biomechanics, then yes, we need to call it for what it is rather than sugarcoating it and saying it's okay. Well then, Dr. Seedman, let's get this bread. Some of you may have seen endless promotional posts on Instagram of strength coaches selling their product or methodology in a way that we haven't really seen before. I mean, we have seen the get a summer bod fast and endless lean bulk programs being pushed around by fitness models. However, now it's all about function. Function or functional training is the key buzzword among this particular group, and it has been bastardized and transformed into a weapon that they can use to prove that their program or tool is better than all else. I believe the best way to approach strength and conditioning is to find the best and safest ways within one's skill set to improve the strength and athletic ability of the subject. I also believe the implementation of the selected movements should reflect the skill set and the experience of the coach as well as the science surrounding the methods. However, a strength coach should never stop learning and trying to implement new things. Though the methodology he or she chooses reflects their own individualistic skill sets, this does not make it any better than anything else. This is where the disingenuousness of the functional coaches come in. They have to prove that what they're doing is better because they're hungry for valuable market shares. By doing so, they're continually making inflammatory and absolute claims that are incredibly flawed. Enter Dr. Joel Seedman. He is a doctor in kinesiology and a strength coach with his program being named Advanced Human Performance. Joel is growing quite the name for himself on Instagram with his wild movement selection and absolute claims. Probably the most inflammatory of the absolute claims that I've seen is on this particular post. When it comes to squat depth and range of motion, this should be determined by your training goals. You know what? Actually, that's a really legitimate statement. I actually, uh, oh shit, there's more. If your training goals are decreased strength, increased joint pain, degradations to natural body mechanics, herniated discs, sciatic issues, chronic low back pain, blown out knees, foot and ankle aberrations, decreased jump performance, degraded gait mechanics, constant muscle tightness, and the need to continually perform foam rolling, stretching, and soft tissue work, cupping, dry needling, and other therapeutic modalities to eliminate the associated pain, then keep squatting ATG or below parallel. Jesus. However, if your goal is improvements in size, strength, performance, power, body mechanics, muscle function, posture, proprioception, balance, stability and mobility, as well as decreased joint pain and muscle tightness, then you'll want to squat between 90 degrees, 10 to 20 degrees above parallel, and parallel, slightly below a 90 degree joint angle. Remember, it all comes down to training goals and objectives. This was a thing said by this guy, right here, in print. I mean, in what world is it okay to make claims like this? It's one thing to squat high because of the handful of studies that may or may not allude to a positive benefit, but it's another to say that anyone who squats lower has this laundry list of negative things coming their way. Before I get too emotionally charged, I'd like to objectively look at the science and the articles that Dr. Seedman continually cites in his retorts to comments from people being like, uh, hey dude, what? And for this, I'll bring on Dr. Sam Spinelli, a doctor in physical therapy and a strength coach. Bonus points, he also snatches 130 kilos. Sam recently participated on a pain science article and there are over 1 million reads thus far. For this section of the video, Sam will look at the references Dr. Seedman cites to support his high squatting superiority claims in both his post and more recently with a post on offset loading. Hi, my name is Sam Spinelli. I'm a doctor of physical therapy and a certified strength conditioning specialist who has a big focus in the rehab world for weightlifting. Zach asked me to come on and talk about squatting and the different depths and the relationship that it has with injury and what the evidence says on the topic because of a few ideas that have been shared by a prominent individual named Joel Seidman. So giving Joel the benefit of the doubt, what does squatting to 90 degrees have as a benefit? Well, first off, you're squatting. Squatting in general is going to be better than not squatting. 
we're gonna have benefit from squatting to at least 90 degrees than not squatting at all. So there is actually literature looking at this topic that we can definitely pull from, so let's look at some of the beneficial studies. One of the first ones is the Rea et al. study from 2016, and this is one that Steven actually cites himself, and it's where they had three different groups, and what they did was they had individuals uh, compare quarter squats, half squats, and full squats, and then look at transferring that over into sprinting performance and jumping performance after a training cycle. And this did actually show that the quarter squat had the highest transfer to sprint and jumping performance. A different study that we can look at is the Basler et al. study from 2014 where they did a similar method where they had individuals do full squats and they also had individuals do full squats and partial squats and the individuals that did the full and partial had a higher performance than individuals that just did full squats. A third study we can look at is one that Seidman again cites himself and it's the Marchetti et al. study from 2016 where they looked at activation of different muscles at different positions. So looking at um, 90 degrees versus 140 degrees of knee flexion and comparing the muscle activation. In that study, they actually did show that the highest activation level for the knee sensors and the glutes were actually at 90 degrees. When we look at squatting to a deeper depth, are there potential problems? There could be. So let's look at some of the evidence on that topic. Schoenfeld wrote a paper in 2010 that looked at different squat depths and the implications it may have, as well as other topics. And in there, he cites a few different uh, papers and textbooks that reference that there may be potential damage for those individuals with patellofemoral disorders to go to a deeper depth. Similarly, for anyone that has a history of a PCL tear, so that's a ligament in your knee because of the posterior shear stress, going to deeper depths may not be ideal. And then also that there's no real benefit from going to a deeper depth for quadricep strength. So in his opinion, he references that there's no benefit going to a deeper depth from those standpoints. There's a paper from Cotter et al. in 2014 that looked at peak knee extensor forces and they did find that greater depths did have greater forces on the knee. Finally, there's a paper from Escamilla in 2001 that looks at the different knee biomechanics of squats and references that there is potential higher shear forces and compressive forces with deeper depths. And so in the author's opinion, it may not be ideal to go to maximum depths in squats. So these papers that I just discussed are some of the most commonly used ones, particularly Seidman uses most of these papers in arguing that we should not squat to a deeper depth. And there's important things that we should consider in these inflammatory statements that are used. First off, in the RAID study, when we actually look at the results, the individuals that were in each group improved significantly and improved in all regards in all of the categories. And that it was actually with a quarter squat that had the highest transfer. So when we look at Seidman's argument, and he's arguing that we should do a 90 degree squat, well, the 90 degree squat actually didn't outperform the quarter squat. So realistically, if we were to take his frame of argument, we should be doing quarter squats. When we look at the Basler study, this is one that looked at actually having individuals do full range and partial and rotate between them and found that having that rotation was beneficial for speed and also jumping performance. And when we consider the mechanisms and the ranges of motion that are utilized in those two activities, it would make sense from a standpoint of specific adaptations to impose the bands. When we look at the Schoenfeld study that was on squatting and the dangers of it, he actually references papers that did not look at any of those mechanisms. And so it's pretty unfair to utilize those references and then inherently utilizing Schoenfeld's paper as an argument in favor of not squatting deep is a pretty weak argument to be used then. In the Cotter study, the one looking at peak forces, the first thing to note is that the authors actually mentioned that there may be some errors, significant errors in their measurements because of the way that they did the study. And then additionally, the knee flexion moments could also not be factored in entirely correctly because of co-contraction that could have happened during the movements that would reduce the force levels. And then finally, the study did not actually measure injury risk in any way, it just measured forces. So we need to be able to take that within context where it applies. When we look at the Escamilla study, the one that's most commonly probably used in this argument, the author himself actually recommends going to full parallel for squats and not going deeper, but to go to parallel because of the benefits that there will be for that. So up until this point, I've tried to do a benefit to Joel and actually present his side to the best degree possible, but I really disagree with him. I think that it's a really shitty argument and that he has done a horrible job of providing the benefit of the evidence across the whole board and he's just cherry picked a lot of studies. So what I'd like to do now is actually examine the global body of evidence to a higher degree. 
when we look at this topic from the standpoint of how much are the muscles challenged, how much are different muscles utilized at different depths, you can see there are five main studies that we can pull that weren't discussed previously. The Bryanton et al. study from 2012, a Paterno study from 2002, a Gibraltar study from 2015, a Kubo et al. study from 2019, and the Contreras et al. study from 2016. In all of these studies, it shows that either number one, the full depth squat compared to a parallel squat compared to a partial squat is either equivalent when it comes to the development of muscle mass, or we see a higher performance in favor of muscle mass and muscle usage to deeper squats, particularly with the knee extensors. So trying to argue in favor of a shorter depth for benefit of muscular mass is probably a pretty weak argument to make. Three papers that didn't get discussed previously from a performance standpoint is the Hartman et al. study from 2012, the Esformes study from 2013, and then the Goosh study from 2013 as well. And this looked at performance across a few different areas of one sprinting performance, improvements in jumping, and also improvements in endurance athletes. And this basically consistently showed that either there was equivalent performance or actually higher performance in those that utilize a greater squat depth. And then finally, when we consider injury risk, since none of that is actually discussed in the previous papers, and we would just be inferring that information, we can look at a paper from Rasky et al. from 2002, where they actually looked at high-level weightlifters, high-level powerlifters, and then just recreational lifters, and looked at the injury rates across the knee, ankle, and hip. And if we were to compare this to other sports, we see a significantly lower injury risk across all of them. And so this tells us that basically for athletes that are performing full depth squats, because we're gonna be required to do that in powerlifting and weightlifting, that there's no inherent injuries to the hip, knee, or ankle more than other sporting activities. So is Joel basically just trying to get us to talk about him more? Probably. It's hard to say. He could just be a really shitty evidence-based practitioner, or he may just ignore the evidence that challenges him, which is definitely possible, or he may be doing this just to generate more traffic and sell more books. It's hard to say. But there's a few prime examples when we look at the literature that he chooses to utilize. We can see that from his own paper that he, or his own blog that he wrote, he references a few different papers that are quite comical. He references a Chandela et al. study from 2012 on the topic, and it looks to uh, examine fatigue on knee joint. And basically, the study actually just looked at if they make someone really tired, can they find 30 degrees of knee flexion compared to when they're not? And basically, when you're really fatigued, it's harder to find that same joint range of motion and you have a greater range. And he uses the study to try and reference that people are at a greater injury risk when fatigued and that somehow squatting to a deeper depth makes you more likely to get injured. But it's out of range of motion that he references so that we should go through. It's not through a mechanism where any, at any point is he telling us that we should not squat to a challenging amount. None of this. So it's a pretty odd way to use that paper. Then additionally, we can see that in the study from Lieber et al. that he references from 1988, and another paper in there as well that he references that utilized frog legs. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water! Why? Why are you referencing frog legs? What does that have to do with an adult human squatting? I have no idea why he does that. And additionally, he uses other, other papers in his, where he's talking about squat mechanics, and he's referencing bulgy tendon organs and the extensors of the forearm. This seems to be excessive cherry picking and really reaching for straws. It's really easy to make an argument that's dichotomous and in favor of just one side and doesn't require any nuance or context, but in reality, that's not how life works. And what's actually going on is that this conversation has a lot more details that go behind it. So if you look at what the evidence actually says, basically, if you are able to tolerate full depth squatting and you participate in a sport that requires full depth squatting, so powerlifting, weightlifting, you should be doing squatting to a full depth. If you are looking to maximize hypertrophy, you will probably benefit from full depth squatting or whatever you are able to do with the maximum comfort that you can. So if you're getting physical pain or actual pain that is causing you to want to avoid a range of motion, then at least temporarily, you should probably avoid that. But if you're able to go to a parallel squat, you probably benefit from going to a parallel squat. When we're looking at it from a performance standpoint, for non-barbell sport athletes, so if this is for an individual that plays basketball, soccer, anything like that, they would probably benefit from having both. So probably having a full range of motion squat in their early portion of their preseason or off season, and then utilizing a quarter squat or a parallel squat or a half squat, something with a restricted range of motion to help work on a higher rate of force development in their more early, the late preseason and actual in-season portion of the development. Thank you for having me on, Zach. I hope this is beneficial to the public. To me, it is the disingenuous nature of Dr. Seedman's shtick that gets me more than any of his methods. 
reinventing the wheel and strength and conditioning with offset loading and all sorts of chains and bands isn't nearly as bad as confusing the world with articles which are supported with very loose, if any, scientific relation. What's really worrying to me is that this could be Dr. Seidman's goal through all of this. Taking the all press is good press route, his Instagram and brand continually grows in the face of scrutiny because the algorithm will continue to push his content around. He's like the Jake Paul of strength and conditioning. 